a couple hundred gigatons of ice gone, lots of surface, two polar bears and one pandemic. And I'll explain all those things in due course. I finished my PhD uh, at the University of Minnesota in 1992. I did my PhD work on Storglasern in Northern Sweden uh, under Roger Hook. Uh, and it was there that uh, I also met my wife, Elisabeth Isaksson, and colleague here at the Polar Institute. Uh, after I was done with my PhD, I uh, stayed with Roger a little bit and then worked with Ian Willens in Antarctica for one field season before taking a job in Oslo and at NVE, working in the subglacial laboratory beneath Svartisen, which I did for five years, and then applied for the job at NPI and, and got it. And then we all moved up to uh, Tromsø. And that's where I've been since 1998. So there's Tromsø on the, the north oriented map. We're way, way up, we're, we're socially distant from many things. We're at 70 degrees north, uh, small town, 70,000 people, and it's kind of wintry here. So this is what it looked like just two weeks ago uh, outside the final major snowstorm, which was a little disheartening to, to have in the middle of May, but we survived and we coped and it started to melt. And once it started to melt, you do what you do everywhere in Tromsø. You start to shovel the snow off of the piles onto the exposed ground so that it'll melt faster. And it goes fairly quickly. There's Elizabeth shoveling the snow. There's two or three days ago, and then that's what it looked like today. Uh, snow is finally going down here, more or less at sea level, but up in the mountains, there's still plenty of nice snow, and there's been lots of skiing. Now, at this point, you may be wondering, uh, isn't this supposed to be about Svalbard field work? Well, this is as close to Svalbard field work as I got this year because of the pandemic. I was unable to make it to Svalbard. But I had a very nice April and May doing lots of skiing. We had lots of nice weather, lots of snow. So let's continue our journey to Svalbard. There'll be lots of pictures because I've missed out, so I have to relive it myself. Svalbard is about an hour and a half flight to uh, the north from Tromsø. It's 60,000 square kilometers or so, 55% covered by glacier, which is about 33,000 square kilometers at this point, and it's shrinking fast. And there are over a thousand glaciers that are greater than one square kilometer in, in area. Okay, and there's the town of Longyearbyen. It's a commercial airport, so it's very easy to get to. It's uh, relatively inexpensive, and there's the, the plains view as you come in for a landing. Uh, interestingly, I got this picture from a site that lists the 10 most dangerous airport landings in the world. Uh, I've never experienced any danger landing on this airport, but uh, at any rate, it's uh, very easy to get to, as I say. So this is one of the things that makes Svalbard a, a very logistically uh, easy target. We'll spend most of our time in the area of uh, Neolison, which is uh, 120 kilometers to the northwest from Longyearbyen, a shorter flight, 20 minute flight with a Dornier, which goes uh, twice a week. And you come into Kongsfjord, the uh, King's Bay, and there's Neolison on the, on the south shore of Kongsfjord. I can tell you also that uh, if you're interested in touring around on uh, Svalbard, Virtually, you can go to Topo Svalbard, where this map product and other map products are available as well as pictures, aerial photographs, both modern and, and older. Very nice site to, uh, to fly around in Svalbard. Svalbard, or sorry, Neolison uh, was originally a coal mining settlement uh, for most of the first half of the 20th century. Uh, intermittently, it was never very successful. Uh, and finally, in the uh, early 60s, after a, a number of accidents, uh, deadly accidents, killing lots of miners, they, they closed down the mine. Uh, Neolison also served as a jumping off point for a number of expeditions. You see the, uh, the remains of the hangar that uh, housed the uh, airship Norga, which Amundsen and Nobile used to uh, go over the North Pole. So it's been yeah, important to, to a number of expeditions. So, beyond that. 
But after they closed the, the coal mine, Kings Bay Cool Company turned into Kings Bay and became a, a service provider for a, a research town of, of Neolson, now called Neolson Research Station, uh, comprising a number of research facilities uh, operated by 10 different countries. And a lot of those uh, and institutes are involved in mass balance measurements. So at the, this point in time, there are 11 uh, glaciers being monitored for mass balance. Uh, and there are a number of reasons for that, uh, some political and uh, some, some scientific. And, but I'm just going to tell you about uh, our monitoring project, which has been going on since the 60s, the NPI mass balance program. And Austerbrügebahn was the first to be measured uh, since 67. The stakes were put in in 1966. So the first mass balance year was 1967. The following year, Mitterlevanbrän was uh, started. The mass balance measurement started on that. And then 1987, Kungsvägen, a larger glacier. And then since 2004, been measuring on Kronebrän and Holterdorf on the Kronebrän being the uh, outlet glacier for the uh, high ice field of Holterdorf on The Brüggebrän is a small glacier, relatively speaking, by Svalbard standards, uh, six square kilometers, reaching only 600 meters above sea level. Mitterlevanbrän, a little smaller, five and a half square kilometers, similar reach. Kungsvägen is a larger glacier, 100 square kilometers, reaching up to 850 meters. And then Kronlebrän and Holterdorf on this, almost 400 square kilometers and goes up to nearly 1,500 meters. This is a view from one of our camera points uh, looking across. There's Kronlebrän in, in the foreground and Kungsvägen in the back. The cane looking structure is a piece of rebar which was stuck there. but serves as a convenient uh, point for, for, for maintaining camera continuity. And the next shows a, a one a day uh, movie of, of the, uh, the movement of, of Kronlebrän. And what you'll notice is that Kronlebrän is moving very fast and it's a calving tidewater glacier and that Kungsvägen is not moving at all that you could see. And uh, the reason for that is that Kungsvägen is a, is a surge type glacier uh, in the quiescent phase, at least at the front at the present time. Kronlebrän is among the fastest moving uh, glaciers in, in, uh, in, in, in Svalbard with speeds yeah, sometimes four or five meters per day at the very front. So the mass balance program, the little history, uh, it started with uh, Norway's first uh, modern glaciologist, Olaf Liestol, who I just have the dates where he's doing the mass balance in, in Neolson, but he actually started NP right after World War II and worked until his retirement in 1986. And then Jan Overhagen uh, took over in 1986. And uh, here he is at his retirement party last autumn, getting presented something by Bernard Le Fauconnier, who joined at some point soon after. I don't really remember the exact dates, uh, but Jan Ove was in charge of the mass balance program from 86 to 93 when he uh, quit uh, after it was decided to move the Polar Institute to Tromsø. And then Bernard uh, minded the mass balance for two years until uh, Elisabeth started uh, work here. And she was in charge of the mass balance from 95 to 99. But at this time uh, we were having our two kids. So uh, she only really did one field season and Bernard was present the, uh, during this time doing, doing the mass balance measurements until I started. And then I uh, took over the mass balance from Elizabeth. And at this point, I've been doing it longer than anyone else. So you could almost say that I've become historical. Now, these are the, the principal investigators, but we obviously couldn't have done it without a huge crowd of people. And I won't even try to thank or mention all the people who've uh, been involved with me. And I just put up some pictures to show a few of the people who I could quickly grab uh, pictures of. There are a lot of people involved in this work throughout these years. So why Svalbard uh, mass balance? Uh, well, our main alibi, as always, is the sea level. Uh, as everyone knows, the current sea level uh, 
increases about millimeter per Part of that is thermal expansion of uh, ocean water. A third is Greenland, Antarctica, and, and then terrestrial water storage, groundwater exchange, and the likes. And then a third is due to all the small glaciers, uh, which includes places like Svalbard. And while Svalbard only makes up a small fraction of that, it's very important uh, that we, uh, for, for, the, for the total budget, that we uh, make the budget for Svalbard to contribute to that knowledge. Furthermore, for future scenarios, we need to know something about the present to be able to model the future. And, and in this way, Svalbard is kind of a, a laboratory case for testing models and uh, because of the excellent data sets that are present here. And then there's the downstream impact, which is, is local, but has, has some global impacts because of the tidewater glacier retreat and the increased melt will impact fjord circulation and the ec ecosystems in, in the fjords. So that's a, a local, uh, effect, but it's also something that we're seeing in Greenland, for example. So there's the whys. A little uh, rudimentary mass balance, of course. Here's a, a very schematic glacier showing the winter accumulation, more accumulation at the top of the glacier than at the bottom because of precipitation gradients and temperature gradients, which uh, mean that the uh, precipitation falls as snow in the upper part in the beginning of the season. Uh, in the summer ablation, it's the reverse. There's more ablation at, at the bottom of the glacier because of the temperature gradients again, also because of the, uh, the snow disappears, then you have darker surface underneath. So increased uh, effect for the radiation. And then the balance of those two gives you the net balance. And then of course, there's the equilibrium line where the net balance is zero. And that's all for a land terminating glacier. If you have a tidewater glacier, then you should also worry about the calving component, the ice that's flowing through the tidewater front. And that is then what we'll, we'll just call if we surface mass balance or climatic mass balance, what's going on in and out of the surface. And the calving is the dynamic part. Uh, let's go to the field and measure mass balance. This is uh, what it looks like as we get all the snowmobiles and sleds together and put the equipment together. We live in Neolosund and we go out, go out each day. Uh, the furthest to drive is about two hours, so it makes sense just to use the, the nice facilities that are there. When we leave town, uh, we need to load our rifles. And this was maybe one of the more discomforting aspects of starting work in Svalbard was the, this idea that there were uh, polar bears out there that, uh, it might want to to eat you. I had been experienced. I had experienced animals that wanted to eat me in northern Sweden because there are lots of mosquitoes there. But uh, this was another uh, another size altogether. So we uh, load up our rifles every day, and uh, and then unload them when we come back in. Still, I have to say that after a couple of years, I won't. It didn't get blasé, but uh, I just never saw polar bears. The only polar bear I ever saw was the one that's. Uh, mounted and stuffed on the way into the dining hall in the Olison until quite recently. So we zoom off to our glaciers and, and this is a typical glorious day of which we have so many. Well, these are the only days we take our camera out to take such pictures. Uh, it's not always like this. Sometimes it's far from glorious and there's very little snow and so you have to wend your way through what's there. It can rain in Svalbard uh, anytime. It can rain in January and it often rains in April. And that leads to this sort of situation where you have giant slush pools, which you can cross if you give enough gas. But if you ease up on the throttle a little bit, then you end up like uh, JC there in, in the slush. But if you have your gloves and your hat and you've got your sunglasses, and you're ready to go. You've got your GPS, you're gonna make it. And if you have your 12 volt espresso maker, then it's gonna be a good day. And you go out and we start to do the snow depth measurements doing uh, conventional probing. Uh, generally, we don't have much more than three meters of snow. So that's relatively straightforward. And we do it on a grid pattern. I'm showing here the, uh, the 21 years of data from Kungsvägen, which initially we uh, when I inherited the mass balance program, we did on 
zigzagging profiles, but I went over to a grid on 500 meters. And at the same time as we're doing this probing, uh, we also have a GPS mounted on the sled behind us so that we can measure the elevation of the snow surface. And thus we're able to make little maps and th thus be able to de detect elevation changes through time. And we do that for the uh, smaller glaciers. Uh, we also have grids on Burgabam and Mitchell but not on Holtedolf one, that's just too big. So we do profiles mostly on the center line. And then to convert that snow depth to water equivalent, you need to uh, dig a density pit. And I'm showing a sequence of pictures to prove to people that actually I have been known to dig density pits and make density measurements. This is not staged. I actually dug this pit. Uh, and you dig to the bottom and then you uh, take cylinders of known volume and you weigh that and then you can get the density as a function of depth and then get the conversion between uh, snow depth and then the water equivalent of the snow. That's fairly straightforward for the winter. You can cover the entire glacier fairly easily, but obviously you can't measure loss as quite as straightforward. So you use uh, stakes, which are installed into the glacier. We use six meter aluminum stakes, which we bore in uh, during the spring. And if you measure the exposed height in spring and the, know the snow depth, then you know what the distance to the ice is. And when you come back later in autumn, which is the picture behind there, you can see I'm measuring the the exposed stake height, then I know how much snow is melted, how much ice is melted, and somewhat similarly for the fern area. And then it's a simple matter to figure out the uh, what has happened since the spring. For the two smaller glaciers, we do all our work uh, on foot in autumn, even though the conditions are not always super nice, typical uh, rainy day on, on uh, Brüggebran. But for uh, Kronebran, uh, we have some stakes that we put out in the, in the crevasse Kronle band. So we need a helicopter. And for the farther reaches, it, it makes sense to do Kungswegen and Holtedolf on a, by helicopter. So the glacier integrated mass balance, we take all those measurements uh, and then we average them, weighting them by hypsometry of the glacier. In our case, you can also have a, a distributed stake system, but you do some sort of averaging process that takes account of the spatial variability. And then you do the same thing for the uh, summer ablation. And then the balance of the two is the net balance. The big Bs, turn it over, put it into your diagram. And this is the final product. Over 50 years of measurements for the two smaller glaciers, 30 years for uh, over 30 years now for Kungsvägen and a few, well, over 10 years now for Kronleban. Uh, some things to say about that. You can uh, see that the summer mass balance is the uh, what is modulating most of the uh, uh, the net balance. There is some signal from the from the winter, but there's less variability of the winter. There is a negative trend for all the glaciers of the uh, accumulation. Uh, it's very weak. It's not statistically significant, but it, it's there. And you can see that the two smaller glaciers are consistently negative. There's only two years with anything like a positive mass balance. And we can see this more easily if we sum the net balance. Uh, this is and they're just shrinking, and they have been doing so since measurements started. About 19 meters for, for Levanbran and uh, 25 meters for Brigabran. And then Kungswegen was uh, slightly increasing until about 2000, and then it's gone into negative territory. If you put on uh, just the surface mass balance for Kronleben and Holtedolf on it, then it's very similar to Kungswegen. But if you then add in the uh, calving and frontal retreat, you can see that that glacier is actually got a higher uh, loss rate than, than the other glaciers, even the small glaciers. So there's the mass balance data for, fall, for uh, four glaciers and Svalbard. I've shown with the yellow dots other uh, currently running uh, mass balance measurement programs all around the archipelago. There are quite a few, as I said, in the Olesund area or along the West Coast. But what about all the other glaciers? Obviously, we can't measure every single glacier. And we have even a hard time uh, doing a, a measuring sort of in a spatially distributed way around Svalbard. It's very challenging. So how are we going to get insight into what's going away from there? Obviously, there are 
two ways. One is with models, and then the other way is with remote sensing. So let me talk first about models. Uh, there are, at the moment, quite a few models that have been published uh, looking at the mass balance of Svalbard, and I'm going to talk about one. It's uh, due to uh, Vard van Pelt, and it's based on work that he started doing as part of his PhD at Imau on uh, Nordenschildbrenn, not far from Longyearbyen. And then he came and did a postdoc with me for one year, uh, and uh, we did this paper on, on uh, two of the glaciers on Kungsfjorden. And then uh, Vard moved over to the University of Uppsala, where he is today. And, uh, but he, he and I have been working since that time, and he was a co-advisor for my PhD student, Ankit Pramanik, who finished up last year. And uh, Ankit simulated all of the glaciers in Kungsfjord. And now uh, the uh, main paper I'll talk a lot about here is Vard's uh, paper on the long-term uh, data set for all of Svalbard, 57 to 2018, which came out last year. Great paper. And the general approach here is uh, to take uh, reanalysis products which have very coarse resolution and then use those to uh, uh, drive a regional climate model for, for the Svalbard area, which is at a 10 kilometer resolution. That is something that the uh, Metrological Institute of Norway has available. So this, these are data that we can access. And then that Bard has written at a one kilometer resolution. And we use the mass balance data as calibration and validation. And then we can also add in uh, glacier AWS data, automatic weather station data for the same purpose. And uh, we have some, uh, I have a network on, on the glaciers that I run together with uh, my colleague, Steve Hudson. I'm trying to foist this whole thing off on him. He resists, but uh, resistance is futile. He will inherit this. Uh, we at the moment, we have four weather stations on Kungsvägen and Holtedolfona. We'll cut down the two on Holtedolf on the to one uh, station. And at the moment, Steve is really working hard on the uh, 10 meter mast that he's installed at Kungsvägen at stake six, which also includes a hefty power supply to, to run the, uh, the ventilated and heated uh, radiation sensors. So the snow uh, ice fern model uh, is compute the uh, surface energy balance from the uh, the available metrological parameters and uh, to, to compute the surface temperature and the melt. And then you uh, have a, a surface model which is coupled to a multi-layer snow model. And so the precipitation allows you to build up the snowpack and then the melt and, and, uh, and, and rain will percolate into the snowpack and the, the model accounts for refreezing. And, uh, and then whatever doesn't refreeze uh, in, on its way down or, or be retained in a slush, will fall out of the bottom of the model as runoff. And then Vard also has a, a, a ground component, so he can actually just use this to simulate snow on ground. So in this last work, the, the model simulates both snow on, on uh, land and, and on glaciers. And that's the left panel shows the mean distribution of, of the climatic mass balance. And then the trend on the, on the right panel uh, is entirely negative. The gray shows where it's not statistically significant, but on Svalbard as a whole, there's a negative trend of, uh, of the net balance. So even though there's a, a weekly positive uh, trend for the precipitation as a whole, this, remember this is for all Svalbard, so it doesn't contradict what we saw in the Olsen, uh, the, the increasing, uh, increasingly negative uh, summer balance is driving the, the net balance into firmly negative territory. And then uh, we just learned today that this paper was uh, published, so it's available uh, around Frontiers, and Vard's model, as well as all the others, are, are incorporated here, and we've uh, put together all the data to, to put together. And Thomas Schuler at the University of Oslo has led this, this work. And uh, that includes also a, a, a new way of averaging the uh, various uh, field measurements, which, which leads to an average that looks something like this, somewhere between, say, 7 and 10 gigatons. And then there's Vard's model, which is uh, fairly consistent. So 
we can say that the climatic mass balance for Svalbard for the for the most recent decade is some, somewhere in excess of uh, five gigatons, uh, perhaps more than ten gigatons in the negative. Now another aspect to, to the to the model is that all the pronounced warming, of course, Svalbard temperatures are are um, becoming significantly warmer. Uh, there's a negative climatic mass balance trend. There's a positive ELA trend. The ELA is going up higher. That leads to a reduction in the fern air volume. And that together with the strong winter warming has uh, significantly reduced the refreezing in the model, which then leads to uh, inc increased doubles over the simulation period. So the, the, the lower uh, line shows the, the land runoff, which changes scarcely at all, but the glacier runoff is increasing quite significantly. And that, that's going to have an impact. And runoff has a very strong impact on Svalbard uh, uh, fjords. This is a, a movie I hope that comes out OK over the, over the web and into other people's house. Uh, if, if you can't see it very well, it's showing the uh, neutrally buoyant freshwater coursing up at the front of Kronebrand. Uh, during the peak of, of summer melt. And you can see lots of little white dots flying around. Those are birds, and they're <clears throat> very definitely hanging out there for a reason. And they're all around the area, and they feed at the glacier front. And a paper that came out in 2014 by my biology colleagues uh, shows the distribution of kittiwake colonies. And kittiwakes are very strong users of, uh, of glacier fronts for feeding. Uh, biologists in Kungsjord have set up cameras and they've taken lots of pictures uh, that look like this. And then some poor person sits there and counts all the birds in each of those pictures. And they put that together in a, uh, so a bird count, which is the black line. And then the modeled runoff is the blue line. And you can see that when model runoff goes down, then the bird activity goes down both in the middle of the summer and toward the end of the summer. So there's a clear connection there. And there's some other uh, work coming out very soon with GPS tagged uh, kitty wakes that show other similar sorts of effects. Uh, white whales show an affinity for tidewater glacier fronts, tagged white whales here hanging out in, in the front of Natorsbran and, uh, and Negribran. And seals, there's an extensive uh, uh, number of seals which have been tagged with uh, CTD sensors on, on their you can see on the top of their neck, you'll see in this next picture, uh, ring seals, they get a little uh, tag which has the uh, uh, conductivity and temperature and, uh, sensor on board, an oceanographic sensor, and then a GPS sensor and a little connection to send the data up to Argo satellite. And uh, Alistair Everett uh, had a nice paper two years ago uh, analyzing the data from these tagged seals and uh, the, this shows where the, the, the seal spent, uh, not this seal, but the four seals spent their time, the majority of their time, right in the, uh, in, in the plume. And we know that the, the seals were going in and out of the plume because the salinity measurements show clearly. So they're, they're, they're in there and they're eating the uh, uh, fish and the, and the plankton. Uh, perhaps seals aren't eating plankton, but the birds are definitely eating plankton that are coming up, being brought up by these uh, freshwater plumes. So, and there are various other uh, biological effects of, of, of the plume. And so it leads one to, to sort of pose the question. We know the glaciers are retreating. This shows the, the tidewater fronts for Kungsfjord with uh, the me darkest measurements being from the uh, 1800s and then the most recent measurements in brighter colors. The glaciers are retreating and at some point they're going to retreat onto dry land. And so the question is what will happen to the circulation in the fjord at that point. Uh, to answer that question, we had a project where we uh, uh, do, did some, some uh, fjord circulation modeling. Postdoc Thomas Torschwick did, did this. Uh, and we used the model runoff at three locations to drive the, uh, the fjord. We uh, just removed the glaciers entirely and moved the uh, same and, and, and added the same amount of fresh water, but instead of injecting it at depth, uh, we put it in at the surface. And this is a, 
we're able to do this because we've done an extensive uh, helicopter radar campaign. So this bed has been uh, mapped <laughs> very carefully over, over its entire domain. So that's what the future will look like, much longer fjord arms. We won't say when it's gonna happen, but at some point it will. And then uh, Thomas has done, some, done the modeling to show what the effect is. I don't have time to talk about that, but uh, I refer you to that paper. And it does have an effect, obviously, on the circula circulation. All right, getting back away from the runoff and uh, back to the mass balance. The other way of looking at the uh, overall mass balance for Svalbard, of course, is with remote sensing. And uh, I'll talk mostly about geodetic mass balance. And that's just simply taking uh, the elevation at time zero and at time one, there's a change. And then you can calculate dz dt over the entire glacier surface. And if you integrate that, then at, for a land terminating glacier, that's equivalent to the sum of the, of the mass balance that you would measure, the surface mass balance. And if you have a tidewater glacier, then you have to add the, the calving as well. So what you measure with geodetic balance will be the, yeah, the sum of the net balance and the calving. And actually, that's quite what we're interested in. Now, that seems very straightforward, but actually it's anything but straightforward to get uh, long-term map products. And uh, way back in 2007, I and Tim James and Tavy and some others, we uh, published a paper in GRL on two glaciers where we were able to put together map products uh, going back to the 30s and to show that there's an increasing trend of, of uh, more and more negative uh, mass balance for these two small glaciers. And then Tim and, and Tavy and others, they uh, added a few more glaciers and there's a little more noise, but it basically shows that the most recent epoch is, is more negative than the preceding ones. But that's fine for, for these uh, individual glaciers. The problem is for doing it for all of Svalbard is there's never really been one uh, single coverage, map coverage, uh, until fairly recently. So this is from Chris Newth's paper on our uh, uh, the, the glacier inventory for Svalbard. And so before 1990, on the left-hand upper panel, you have some coverage from the 30s and then from 60s and 70s. Uh, and then in 1990, we have a nice, uh, pretty good aerial photo coverage of the entire archipelago, but it was never completely analyzed for various reasons, uh, ha having to do with the move of NPI and then the acquisition of new aerial photos. Uh, so it's, it's an incomplete picture. And then in uh, 2000s, we start to get remote sensing products, which span the decade with variable quality, but there's really not one single snapshot. Uh, Chris, nonetheless, for as part of his thesis, did a, a nice paper where he uh, took the, the different map products and then differenced them with the uh, ISAT data that, that covered them. Uh, and obviously, each one of those panels cover, covers a different time interval. And then there's also the problem that the ISAT uh, tracks are quite sparse for, for somewhere like Svalbard. And uh, Geir Moholt, when he was a PhD student at the University of Oslo, uh, he used only ISAT to, to uh, look at the change during, during the ISAT period. And Geir now works, of course, with us at the Polar Institute. So that was what we were able to do uh, until recently. But now the, the uh, NPI DM, which used to be more of a hodgepodge affair of, of very different dates, is slowly crystallizing around uh, the aerial photos that were obtained between 2008 and 2012, with the bulk of them in these three years, 2009 to 2011. It's still not quite complete, but uh, by the end of uh, next year, it will be one more or less time uh, snap covering the, the entire archipelago. But that starts to be uh, 10 years ago now. What's going on after that? And luckily the Arctic DM has uh, popped up. It's a great product. You can download the, the uh, mosaics at different uh, resolutions, two meters up to a kilometer. The only problem is that they're made up uh, of non timestamp pixels. So you don't really know what uh, date they're from. And if you want to make DMs from individual years, then you have to roll up your sleeves and work with the individual strips that, that are used to make the Arctic DM mosaics. 
and they cover the period 2012 to 2017 in the latest release. And I'll just talk about the 13 to 17 data because they're the, the better quality. And I can't, don't have enough time to tell you about what you need to do, but it's for making individual years, there's some, uh, some work to get the, co, the images co-registered in X, Y, and Z. And I've made now five DMs for these five years. As you can see, they're not by any means complete. There are lots of holes, but this allows to interest. So one thing you can do is that each pixel, you can uh, take any pixel that has three years of data, you can fit a line to it, and then you can calculate what DZDT is. I chose three years because that gave a pretty good coverage. There's still some holes, but you can uh, filter and fit fill those holes and then you come up with a more or less continuous map of DZDT. And then of course you can integrate those by the, the individual glaciers to calculate the mass balance for each one of those glacier drainage basins. If you have sharp eyes, you might see there's some black uh, glaciers in, in central Spitsbergen. And, and those are places where there just wasn't enough data for even three years of, da of, of data. So this is a little problem that I'm working with at the moment. But at any rate, uh, for a number of the glaciers, uh, it works quite well. And we can compare then uh, on the left panel, the measured mass balance, which will include the frontal ablation for those glaciers, which have tidewater fronts. And then on the uh, y-axis, we have my estimated geodetic mass balance. And I think it does a reasonably good job with one exception, which is the uh, glacier, which is one of those black dots. It doesn't have uh, any uh, DZDT data in it. But otherwise, not too bad. And if you then average the uh, regions or the, for all Svalbard, you get a number like 17 gigatons total for the uh, the sum of the climatic mass balance and the dynamic losses. and that comes out to about 50 centimeters uh, meter water equivalent per year for the entire archipelago, with the most negative being southern Spitsbergen, of course, because uh, that's well known from before. But a surprisingly negative uh, uh, um, mass balance for Nordaustla, and that has a lot to do with this ongoing surge of Basin 3, a very large surge. Uh, <clears throat> This is one estimate which is um, made using a, 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 a density assumption. Uh, and, and this estimate varies with how I uh, account for the density of the volume change. Uh, but that's sort of the, the middle-ish uh, numbers, minus 17 gigatons. And then we go to, the, again, back to the Schuler et al. paper, which just came out then. Uh, We've also made a, a plot of the total mass balance, which is uh, either obtained from geodetic estimates or from uh, uh, the um, GRACE satellite data. And I refer you to the paper to, uh, uh, to, to, to find out more about what, what goes into those individual measurements. But that's, that's where the, uh, uh, the Arctic DM estimate that I've just done, which I'm in the middle of doing it. it's not published yet, so it's not able to, to come into the, this recent paper. And then uh, this paper is, we've just learned is coming, is, is, is accepted, sorry, by Ash, it's by Ash Morris, who's with us in Gaia, and it uses cryosat data uh, to calculate the, the, the mass loss for all Svalbard. And it, uh, Ash and Gaia come out with minus 16 gigatons, so it's very close. It would basically plot right over the one I just showed there. And if we compare then that to the, the um, surface mass balance alone estimate in, in the red there, that's the difference. That's the, the difference is due to the dynamic component. That is to say, the, the calving flux and to all the surges that are going on at the moment. And there are a lot of surges going on in Svalbard. So, the subject of surges would be an entire uh, lecture in itself. Uh, I'll just say that something happens at the bottom of the glacier and uh, kicks the glacier into action. 
It's very likely uh, hydraulic in nature. And once the glacier starts to move faster, the crevasses open up, allowing water to flow into the glacier and uh, maintain high water pressures, which allow the, the uh, surge to continue until uh, we can advance very far. Uh, and we can use now the, the Arctic DM uh, coverages for these individual years, difference those to get some insight into some of these uh, surges. So each one of the lower panels then is uh, the difference between 13 and 14, 14 and 15, and so on. So there's the basin three at Austfona. Uh, you can see some of the effects of the strips for the individual years, uh, but you can also see very clearly that the, uh, uh, the surge extent increases into neighboring glaciers through time. And then you can also see the start of uh, uh, the neighboring basin, basin two and a half. Uh, I don't know quite what to call that. It's nameless. But that's a little surge that started. And then there's an, even another one that started next to it, which, which terminated quite quickly. Negriban, uh, as I said, is, uh, that started surging around 2015. Uh, and it's seen first time really clearly into the, the, the most rightmost panel. Nathorst Brain is another huge surge that started already in 2007. It's been continuing on for a, over a decade. It's still continuing from 2015 to 16. And then in the final panel, it seems to have stopped. And then there's some other little interesting things going on, like uh, one of the upper arms there of uh, going into to, uh, the Nathorst Brain system. There is a, uh, a little surge that has started and uh, it, terminates going going in. So we see that several places. We also see little small mass movements, which lasts a short time. And, and there's another, uh, seems to be a, a surge that starts propagating down and then gets stuck through time. Wallenberg Bran is the glacier you'll see as you fly to Njolson on your left hand side. And uh, this progressed from the front and worked its way up. Uh, Osborn Bran is a glacier that last surged in the early 90s, and uh, we see it reactivate sometime around here, and it's now starting to, to go fairly fast. And Monaco Bran, that uh, Tavi knows quite well, she did a very nice paper on the surge that occurred here in the early 90s. And in the final panel, we start to see uh, the reactivation of a surge and, and the recent velocity data that Adrian Luckman has. Uh, shown me shows that it's in, in full surge mode. Uh, well, speaking of Adrian, uh, Adrian is uh, great for finding surges. He's always sending emails to me, oh, there's a new surge. And I've never been able to beat him at finding a surge yet, but I finally found one that he couldn't see with his uh, velocity analysis. A little Emma brand. Uh, this is something that you, you barely notice, and it certainly doesn't show up in any, on any of the radar or satellite products that Adrian uh, uses to, to uh, see velocity increases. So I think that was it for the surge. Uh, well, this is the, the final surge. This is one that I definitely found. Uh, this is Kungsvegen with the uh, classic stakes numbered one through nine that were first put in there by Yonova uh, way back when. And there's the, the mean equilibrium line altitude is somewhere around there. Uh, we know from work that Sveinatic Hamran did back in the early 90s that uh, Kungsvegen is entirely temperate uh, in the fern area apart from the upper most 15 meters. And then in the ablation area, there's only a, a layer of about 50 to 100 meters of cold ice. Uh, Heidi Sylvester has shown that that cold ice area has gone up, moved up glacier a little bit up to stake five or so, but uh, basically Kungsvegen is temperate at its base uh, almost all the way, except at the very front. And then uh, this is a very classic pattern for the DHDT of, uh, of a surge type glacier. The uh, accumulation area is increasing in thickness and it's, uh, thinning at the at the front, and this is based on the uh, the elevation data that that we collect when we're doing our uh, snow sounding. And then we've been monitoring, of course, the uh, the positions of the stakes, which allows us to calculate the velocity. And 
initially, as I was doing this every other year, I'd get very excited because the velocity would go up and I thought, oh, well, surge. And then the next year I would be disappointed because it went back down again. But finally in 2014, it became apparent that something was happening and we see a very strong increasing trend. Uh, there's no doubt that something has started happening here. So it's gone from less than eight meters a year to uh, almost 30 years in the last annual six signal there at stake six. We have to remember this is early days. This is only uh, eight centimeters a day. And once the surge gets going, it's uh, going to be moving at speeds more like meters per day. So how long it takes to get there, we don't know because as far as I know, no one on Svalbard has really seen the uh, startup from, from really from scratch, from these very, very low speeds, which you wouldn't be able to detect with remote sensing methods even. Uh, if we look at the uh, velocity as a function of distance relative to stake one, uh, then we see that the lower part of the glacier is uh, not changing at all. There's a, a looks like a slight uh, increase here, but that's actually because of a movement of the reference stake there. But the upper glacier is, is increasing in speed very clearly. And we have the gray line, these are uh, the velocity data that uh, Yanova and, and Chateau Melville made in the early 90s for sort of for reference. Um, and another thing we can see is that the zone of, of uh, extending flow is, is uh, moving down glacier. So there's, and then we can see that there's a bulge forming and then uh, compression down glacier from, from that, so at the, this point around stake seven. And if we uh, then calculate the strain rates, longitudinal strain rates between the different glacier sets, uh, stakes uh, from nine to eight, eight to seven and so on, we can see that the, the extension is, is strong in the upper uh, three stakes. And if we put in an arbitrary crevassing threshold, there, there is no single threshold, but 0 0.003 per year is a kind of proves my point, which is that only within the most recent years, uh, two or three years, have we started to get enough extension to open up crevasses. And sure enough, looking at the GPR in 2018, we started to see crevasses. Here we have the winter snow lying on top of fern, and we see hyperbole that are uh, significant of or what, what, what you find when you, when you drive your radar uh, across the crevasse. And there's Chris Newth digging uh, down exactly where that uh, hyperbole was to find this crack. So at this point, the crack wasn't very large. Uh, that was in spring of 2018, but by September of 2018, we start to see that they're, they're, uh, some of them are getting quite large. Once these cracks open up, then summer melt has better access to the bed, and this will lead to further development of the surge. So we're monitoring the, the, the surge. Uh, Chris and I have been uh, running continuous GPS stations for the past years, and we'll continue to do so. Uh, We've been doing radar. Uh, obviously, we're doing the, the GPR to, to measure the uh, snow thickness and then also to, to document the, the uh, start of the crevassing and then deep radar to map the bed. And then we've also uh, had Svein Eric Hominon up, uh, not with the Mars 2020 rover, but with prototypes for the radar, which is mounted on the Mars 2020 radar. And he was using it to redo the lines that he did in the early 90s. Uh, these data we're still waiting on because uh, the Mars 2020 rover has the 2020 rover has been capturing a lot of his attention. It's going to be sent up in a couple of months, and then maybe we'll see what what has happened with uh, the changes. And then there was uh, boreholes were put in. This was work that uh, we got funding uh, together with with Doug Ben and Adrian and and with. Uh, uh, Brian Hubbard and, and uh, Chris Borstad, who was at Eunice at that time, he's now at Montana. Uh, and we, uh, there were two boreholes drilled and uh, for various reasons, there aren't any data I can show you quite yet, uh, but they're, they're coming and we will continue to do uh, the borehole work because uh, Thomas Schuler got uh, his Mamma Mia project funded. It, it's quite an elaborate out, uh, acronym. I can't remember what it stands for, but it's not the movie, it's the Glaciology product, Project. And there will be more boreholes in the future. There were to be boreholes this 
very month, but uh, obviously that didn't happen. So this will be going over the next few years. So stay tuned for these and other data. Uh, this was the plan. We were going to be around up to 20 people, staggered different times, coming up and doing different things, uh, and have the helicopter up there. And after, of course, the corona shut down travel and Svalbard uh, restricted travel very stringently, this is what ended up happening. Uh, nobody from the mainland could go up to Svalbard unless they were going to do two weeks of quarantine. And that was only after around mid-April or so. So uh, Steve Hudson and Jay Stigalay were up, uh, my colleagues uh, at NP, they were already up in Longyearbyen since January, we're doing a year there. And then my master's student, Emily Gaiman, was uh, studying at Eunice. And they were all able then to get up to uh, Yolson to do a, a, a skeletal uh, mass balance program. And uh, they did a great job. Uh, and uh, under the circumstances, and, and as I'll show you, the very trying circumstances, we were doing this somewhat remotely. They were sending data to me and I was plotting it and I sort of didn't really uh, focus on the fact that this was a extremely low accumulation year. I mean, a, a record low for, for all the glaciers and particularly for Kronlebrin and Holt, for Holtedolf on that. So never seen so little snow and furthermore, the snowpack had no ice lenses. It was a very cold winter. Uh, and the, the hoar layer was very, very uh, uh, thick. And furthermore, uh, when we did our autumn measurements in early September, there was a further 10 or 20 centimeters of melting. And this all led to uh, there being a, a too thin snowpack. And uh, on one of the days on Holtedolf on a returning back, Emily Snowmobile broke through this crevasse uh, in an area where we had never seen crevasses, uh, even really in the uh, in the autumn, much less in spring. And she went down about 10 meters, they estimate. And she was absolutely fine down there. And within less than an hour, JC and Steve were able to, to get her back up on the surface. Uh, we have harnesses underneath our snowmobile suits with webbing and a carabiner coming out so we can do quick rescues and we train for that. Uh, or, but this was obviously just not the sort of thing anyone would ever want to see. And it was, uh, well, for us back here, it was a pretty terrible experience to, to see this and, and not to be able to be up there with the team. So a great job by the team and uh, a happy ending despite the, the, the terrible circumstances. When in the end, I have to come back to the polar bears. As I said, for 18 years, this was really all I ever saw of, of polar bears were tracks. And this is one that we came across in 2018, walking away from the glacier. But then the next day, it came back down. And as we were driving back home, uh, suddenly uh, one of the people stopped. And then we looked up and there was this polar bear in the moraine. And this was the first polar bear I ever saw in the field in, in 18 years. So we sat and watched the polar bear for a while and then the polar bear started to walk down toward us. And so we went home and then that was that. So that was the first polar bear I saw. And then I said there was a second polar bear. This looks like it might be the uh, sunset shot signaling the end of my talk because it's almost 11. Uh, but this is the view from my office, too, and uh, I stay in a cabin just around the corner from the yellow cabin. And last September, at around midnight, I went back and it was much darker than it was now. And as I do every time, as I walk around the house, I wonder, where would I go if there was a polar bear? Well, there's no polar bear. So I went into my cabin and then got into bed. And suddenly I hear firecrackers. I go to my window and... Uh, and the night watchman is firing flares to scare away a really large polar bear that was just outside my cabin. So if I'd gone back to the cabin 10 minutes later, maybe I wouldn't be giving this talk. Anyway, it's not a very exciting polar bear story. My colleagues at Hornsund have many more fun stories about polar bears, but that was all I saw in, in 20 years. And with that, I'll stop talking. It's now 11, and I'm going to put up very quickly, uh, an advertisement for Adam Booth's talk. 
next Wednesday, 3rd of June. Fantastic fiber optics. Okay, thank you very much, Jack. Um, so there's a chance for people to ask questions. Uh, the way we've done this is that if you type yes or something like that in the chat, we'll find you, unmute you, or you can unmute yourself and uh, ask a question. While people are thinking, I'll ask you a question, Jack. Um, What's your best feeling of the uh, quiescent phase length in Svalbard? Do you have a, a good feeling there? Well, we used to say uh, decades to uh, you know, 100 year time scale. Uh, there are a few that have had, uh, the tuna brain I think was somewhat regular. I don't remember the exact interval. But then there have been a number of, of uh, I mean, a tuna brain had surged and then we'd expected something like, I don't know, another 20 years before it would happen again. And then it happened almost immediately afterwards. I'm sorry, I don't remember the exact uh, time intervals. And, uh, but, uh, and then I think Blomstrandbrenn also uh, surged a little bit earlier than you might have anticipated. Uh, and, and so part of, part of the, the in increased number of surges that we can observe has to do with our, our better ability to observe. So now it's not just the basin threes, which you couldn't miss at all. Uh, we can see these partial surges. I didn't talk about uh, the neighboring glacier of Kungsvegen, which has been undergoing a very slow, undramatic easing out over the last 10 or, or more years with no dramatic crevassing or even really frontal advance, but a clear transfer of mass. So I think it's shortening. Uh, it was posited, I think someone proposed that in, uh, with global warming that there would be uh, thinning and fewer surges, but then uh, it's another, another plausible explanation is with, with more warming, you've got more melt and then more possibilities for starting a surge. Pete, I think you have a question. Hi Jack, it's Pete in, uh, in Edinburgh. Um, you seem sort of pretty confident that Kongsvegen is going to carry on accelerating beyond the sort of 28 meters a year. So I just wonder, what, um, well, one, what makes you think that, and two, when and sort of how fast do you think it will get, and when would it stop? What's your hunch? Uh, I won't say anything about the uh, the, the longer term uh, when it will really get going or when it will stop, but. Uh, since its last surge was 1948, and since we've always been accustomed to thinking about decadal time scales, I've been kind of waiting for this to happen. <laughs> uh, so it, it seems entirely plausible that it will indeed continue to uh, uh, accelerate. And it seems to accelerate very fast once it gets going. I, I don't remember what, uh, Tavi, what you showed for Monaco brand, but it was. Uh, it was a very steep upward rise in velocity, as I recall. So I hope it happens sometime in the next 10 years or so, so that I can uh, document it before I retire. <laughs> Any more questions for Jack? Tolly's got a question. All right. Okay. Um... No, hi, Jack. Thank you very much for the very nice and very interesting presentations. I'm curious about the 2019 uh, little snow amount in the winter. Is there any way you can get measurements from other places? I mean, is it quite consistent though as well? I, I don't know yet because uh, obviously a lot of field parties haven't been able to, to get out. Um, and I haven't looked at any of the model uh, results. Uh, Geir Moholt and uh, company are heading off to Austfona in the next couple of days, they hope. And uh, then we'll, we'll get some information from there uh, and then see whether this is something that was just local to uh, Northwestern Spitsbergen or if it really was all of Svalbard. My own personal theory is that all the snow that was meant to Svalbard got dumped in my uh, front lawn, but uh, mm -hmm. I might be wrong. 
Uh, Paco, I think you have a question. You should be unmuted now, so go for it. Uh, yes, hello. Uh, nice talk, Jack. Uh, you have shown uh, this uh, increasing trend uh, from the modeling in the presentation, but also in your glaciers, you had some uh, slightly decreasing trend. But what about the uh, liquid precipitation? Do you have clear signs of uh, any trend, increasing trend overall in Svalbard? Yeah, well, the um, yeah, are you thinking about the the the, the precipitation altogether, or uh, or no, the, rainfall uh, amounts? Rainfall. 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 Yeah. rainfall amounts are are going up. Uh, winter rainfall amounts are going up, and uh, I'm not so sure. I don't remember for for what the summer is. I'd have to refresh my memory on that. But obviously, with the warmer winters that we're getting. There, there's a lot more uh, rain on snow events, for example, in the last decade. Okay, thanks. Hmm? I think Hester's got a question. Hi, Jack. Hi. You have you have less snow than in Canada right now. Um, so, with with all the intensity of the measurements and the, the different types of measurements that you've done in Svalbard. Can you extrapolate particular things to regions that we don't have that many measurements, and particularly Arctic regions uh, like the Russian Arctic? What what are kind of the key points that you think you can extrapolate to those regions? Well, I think that that uh, it just uh, gives you some hints about how you should be parameterizing your your models, uh, because otherwise, uh, for example, the the uh, the regional climate model that that we use to drive Vard's model is uh, it, it's got a very large domain that extends into uh, Franz Josef Land, and it would is possible to to uh, then run Vard's model there. And in the absence of any calibrating or validating data, you would uh, appeal to some similarity to to uh, the neighboring area. I think that that would be the short answer. Is I think we've run out of questions there, unless anyone's got a last question. Um, I've been asked to um, mention that uh, we're going to have some talks that will be in at the same time, but they will be three shorter talks. Um, and we're particularly enthusiastic to get some early career researchers presenting in those. So then there'll be one hopefully in July at the end of the advertised seminar series. So this is a good opportunity for people who are um, doing their PhD or have a project that perhaps is uh, ongoing rather than fully, fully finished. Um, so if you'd like to um, participate in that, um, you can drop a message to the early career um, group in the IGS or just on the Facebook page or on, um, you can answer the email on Cryolus, so that would be really great. So thanks very much indeed, Jack. It was really, really great. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks everyone for attending.